All right, let's welcome in our guest to The Old Man and the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter. Uh, for this episode, we're going to be joined by one of the all-time great Duke players, uh, Grayson Allen, current Memphis Grizzly. Uh, Grayson, what's up, bud? What's up? Appreciate you having me. Oh, thanks for doing this, man. What? Uh, so you guys got eliminated uh, during the seeding games like yeah. like us. Uh, what what have you been doing the last few weeks? Uh, I've been traveling around, going to see family. Um, it's been – I was uh, in Memphis for the time during quarantine because I was rehabbing so that I could try to actually play in the bubble because uh, I was out before. So I hadn't been around family at all even through the bubble. So I made sure to come back to Jacksonville, see my parents. Um, was in North Carolina for a little bit where my girlfriend is. So just making sure I'm seeing people now before I start working, working out again. For the YouTube viewer, um, I just want to say you have an incredible setup <laughs> behind you. I see some Duke basketballs. I yeah. see some trophies. So I assume you, you keep your, your paraphernalia at your, at your parents' house. Yeah, yeah, it's at it's at my parents' house. This is like this is my dad's project right here. This is his whole setup. So, when when I get a house one day, this will this will transfer over to mine. And we were commenting, we were commenting before we started recording. You have an HD setup, which looks incredible. By far the best visual of anybody that we've had <laughs> on this show. I'm gonna text you when we're off so I can get that equipment. So you're streaming. Yeah. <laughs> so are you are you gaming? Are you gaming every day? What's going like? What's the deal with the stream? Yeah. So I've been gaming every day. I haven't been streaming um, because I've been traveling around and using a laptop. But I had this whole setup uh, in the bubble with me. So when I was in the bubble, I was streaming from there a few times, and so that's why I got the the nice camera uh, setup. I've been gaming every day here. Yeah, I feel like a lot of guys were. Or were and are gaming in the bubble like that's probably the most prevalent non basketball activity. Yeah. Um, Josh Hart was all over it. Myers Leonard yeah. all over <laughs> it. Devin Booker all over it. Like it's it's. What do you think? It, what do you what do you think it is about that that it's so popular with with NBA guys? I I well for me at least you get to be competitive while relaxing at the same time. So like I get to be like mentally engaged and like actively doing something that's competitive but also like you know i don't want to be on my feet at all i just want to be relaxed sitting back in a chair and gaming so and i've also like done it since i was a kid so by it's not i haven't been i wasn't like sitting down and watching tv all the time i was playing video games if i had free time wait till you're married pal tommy i know <laughs> i know i've mentioned this before but i have not played i had i had not played a single video game since 2009 and wow. um, we, I recently bought an Xbox, a PS4, and a Nintendo uh, Switch for my kids because my oldest is getting to the point now where he can game a little bit. So th I only downloaded one game. I downloaded uh, the 2K21 golf game for uh, PS4, and I've tried to play it with him, but he sabotages every round because he thinks it's hilarious to either hit it in the parking lot or, <laughs> or at people. <laughs> or in the water like we can never actually finish a round because we'll be like four holes in and we've been playing for an hour and a half it's drives me drives me crazy <laughs> can we can we talk about this 2k21 uh nba rank three-point shooting rankings for a second oh we should we did should. you see these grayson no i didn't so wait so somebody sent me a screenshot of our team though and I don't know if it was actually in the game. This was like released right before, like the day before it came out. That I had like a my sh three point shooting was less than Jonas Valanciunas on our team. <laughs> so I, I hope that's not accurate. I haven't actually seen that in the game yet, but I hope that's not how it is. So the the thing that we were, I don't know how. I'm very curious what how they decide to calculate these things. But the thing we were looking at on Saturday was they did it. They did a three point shooting rankings. Um, for best three point shooters, Steph was number one. JJ was number five. You were not in the top fifteen, which you should have been statistically. Uh, Duncan was number sixteen, and there were like three or four guys on the on in the top fifteen who aren't even in, in the league right now, who are just guys that like were playing last year, or whatever it is. Jared Dudley was like eleven guys who aren't playing. What's your like? What is your when the game comes out, is your initial reaction like, 
like let me what's what's the first thing that you do are you immediately going and playing as yourself uh so i actually don't play 2k that much like i oh, used to play it a ton but uh i just you know, i was playing basketball so much i didn't want to go home and play a basketball video game and the video game frustrates me for that reason so like say if i was playing with the pelicans and i'm on a fast break well jj's character will cut to the rim instead of going to the three-point line so <laughs> it just gets too it's too it's too yeah. that actually that makes sense i think there's something weird there's also probably an element of like when you live something every second of every day, you need a little bit of like a release. I got to do something else. Yeah, you're doing something where you're just not thinking about it. Yeah. What's the what? What are you playing? What's the game? Uh, mainly like first person shooters. So Apex Legends is probably my the biggest game that I play. Um, after that would be Warzone. Um, I've played Fall Guys, which have y'all seen the videos of fall guys going around just a goofy kids game that oh yeah yeah loves. yeah <laughs> jj have you seen this uh JJ's i'm out fucking I'm, I'm trying to find this i'm trying to find these rankings on Twitter. <laughs> i'm gonna find it i'm gonna find it i'm gonna find it I'll it's driving right me now. crazy dude I, i'm just going through i'm trying to find these no I, but i have i have not seen the fall guys no no i haven't i feel like i feel like they have to do the the rankings a certain way to make players overall better than others because that's what most people get upset about Oh, your overall ranking, right? right. Yeah, like you're like who's a ninety four and who's a ninety two. I don't, I don't know. I'd love to know how they actually come up with it. What were, what was the Grayson? What was um? We're gonna talk about the your the basketball in a second, but in the bubble, you know, your overall experience in terms of like, were you hanging out with like your sort of friends from college? Like, what was the what was your kind of like social experience like? Uh, I mean. Not really. Like I saw you, you'd, I would see everyone and you'd, you'd catch up with them a little bit, but um, I wasn't, I didn't really do much stuff outside of, you know, our practice and then going back to the hotel, hanging out with some guys on the team, like around our like block of hotel rooms that we had there. Um, like I, I wasn't one, I, I wasn't going and hanging out by the pool much. Like I did that maybe two or three times. And um, so I was, I was kind of a, a hermit there, which, didn't make it easier, but um, it was all right. You you played really well in the bubble. Uh, so you averaged uh, twelve a game, shot forty seven percent from three. Uh, I, I think it was the first time that we really got to play against each other, and you hit five threes, maybe six. I don't know, three or four of them were on me um, when I overhelped. Uh, <laughs> I uh, how how important uh, was you know, those, how important are those games just in terms of building your overall confidence, you know, in your, in your second year as a player? Uh, I, I think it's, it's definitely really important because uh, you don't, I haven't gotten met many opportunities to do that. Like there haven't been many opportunities where I've been able to go out and play like that. And um, for when I, when people ask me about this, I just say, you know, like there wasn't, I wasn't necessarily, you know, being more aggressive in certain spots or anything. It was, I was earning extended minutes out there and then taking the same shots that I would. And then there were a few games where, you know, job is such a focal point for the other defense that I'm, I'm just getting open looks. So I, I think it was important for me to like, this is, this is like to just know, like, this is what I do on the offensive end. And, you know, there's a game like against the Pelicans, like y'all, where you were you were overhelping. You said that happened in a few games. People overhelping because there's such a threat in the paint on our team that I'm gonna get open looks. And so, I think it was important for me to just realize that I'm earning my minutes in other areas on the court, and then these shots are just coming to me. And hitting 40 percent obviously helps you stay out there. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's true. I, so much of my early career was a very similar experience where. I felt like I had to sort of adjust to how I played at Duke to where what my role was in the NBA. And so it was figuring out like, how do I stay on the court knowing that the ball's not going to come, you know, run through me, that I'm just basically going to be, you know, a spot up shooter and I've got to be ready to knock those shots down. Um, so how, I guess how, how has your overall experience been adjusting to the NBA, you know, from, from, how you got to play at Duke and the experience of playing at Duke, which we're going to talk about in a bit, but just the overall experience of, of, of playing in the NBA versus Duke. 
So I think what what's helped me is you know watching film, watching film on games where I might only get two or three shots. Like I th- I think our second to last seeding game, we played the Bucks and I only I only got maybe one or two three point attempts that game and um, had like seven points. The other games I was shooting like six or seven threes and just watching the the film on that game like people weren't helping off my side and. It's, you just have to realize what that's doing for your offense. Like if I have a guy that's stuck to me, there's something else that's open. There's something else that the defense is giving up. And so if, you know, you have to kind of for, force yourself to be unselfish in the sense where like I'm shooting the ball so well that someone else is getting a look, right? You have to remind yourself that some good stuff is happening offensively, even though you're not touching the ball, like you're still doing your job. You're still doing something for the team even when, you know, five minutes go by, you might have only touched the ball one time. So there, there's that where you have to, you have to like see the game and see what you're doing on the offensive end. That's actually helping even when you don't have the ball. I, I think some of that is just put, putting your ego aside and, yeah, for sure. and you know, when I first, I'll, I'll share something and I'm embarrassed to share this, but I remember having a conversation with my agent at the time uh, during the summer between my, my senior year at Duke and my rookie year with the Magic. And I remember telling him, like, we're going to make the playoffs next year. And he's like, you guys, you guys aren't going to be able to score. There's no one on your team that's, that's c- can score. And I'm like, I can score. I was like, I'm going to score like 18 a game next year, <laughs> you know? And uh, I scored six, and I only played in half the games. <laughs> I, I didn't even average eighteen minutes a game. Um, you know, it was such it was such a, it was such a rude awakening for me. And ultimately, it humbled me and it, and it helped me grow so much as a as a person and a player. What was your expectation coming into the NBA after such an illustrious career at Duke? Uh, well, I mean. So my first my first year I played for Utah and Utah was hungry to get into the playoffs and so you know my expectation was you know I can come out here like shooting is going to get me on the court right like shooting is in a, something that immediately gets you on the court and then um, you know I I know that I'm more than a shooter I can drive and be a secondary playmaker create for guys play in the pick and roll and all this so I felt like I could be really involved on the offensive end. Um, but then that first season goes by and it's like tough, like real, real tough to get any kind of minutes on the court. Um, you know, I felt like because we were like, because the West is so competitive and especially my first year, it was so competitive and every game counted. It felt like there was so much pressure on every minute I was out there that like one mistake. And that was it for me for the game. Like it could happen in the first 30 seconds and I was out or it could happen five minutes later and I was out. So there was, there was so much pressure. I went back to like, it's completely opposite from being a, like a senior at Duke where you have like, there's absolutely no pressure on you to make mistakes, right? Like you have like the, just freedom out there because I'm playing 40 minutes a game. So you have to kind of go back to like realizing like kind of like when you're a freshman first getting minutes on the court, like, you know, it's okay if I mess up, like that just happens. Like I don't need to be too hard on myself for getting yanked for a mistake. That's just going to happen. But it was definitely – like it was definitely hard at first because you know you want to be out there I feel like I could do so many things out there you're just not getting the opportunities to Doc Rivers always talks about uh clutter free basketball that was a a term that I I learned from him and when you're the guy at Duke you can play clutter free basketball coach K gives you an immense amount of freedom to just go play. And mm-hmm. honestly, at times, you know, especially later in my career, when I, when I had that trust, like I got to sort of try shit in games. <laughs> and the opposite of that is when you're, you know, a young player who's trying to establish uh, himself in the NBA and you have a shorter lease or leash in terms of mistakes, then there is a little bit of clutter there. Um, the other, the other point, at least for me, and, and maybe you could talk a, a little bit about this, with with Utah was you know you you don't realize until you're in the NBA how good every NBA player is so like for me I looked at a guy like Keon Dooling well Keon Dooling before I got there he averaged like nine a game I'm like oh I can do better than that I'll play over this guy <laughs> and then I get there and the guy kicks my ass in training camp and I'm like oh Keon Dooling's really good like yeah. you have to be really good to average nine in the NBA 
And then Keith Bogans played over me my second year, and he brought something defensively that I didn't have. And so, you know, I remember Zion on our podcast talked about Etwan Moore. He was like, holy shit, Etwan Moore is awesome, you know? And, <laughs> and you don't really realize it. You know, even as a, as a high-level college basketball player, you don't realize how good every player is until you're in it and until you're you're on a team. Right. Oh, I mean, for sure. And I, I slowly started to realize that when I was at – when I was at Duke, because going into my third or fourth year, there were so many young guys in the league that I had either played with on Duke or played against. And you just see them in games and you, going up against guys, when you start to watch closer, you're like, some of the guys that like you would never think of that are eighth or ninth guy on the bench, like if you're just a casual NBA fan, you would never think of it or just like out there giving them buckets or giving them a hard time on the defensive end. Like, um, so that's something, or even guys that don't even make the league and go overseas, like your opinion of overseas when you're just a high school basketball player is so different than once you get there. You're like, I mean, those guys can play like they're those, like people all across the world can play. So, um, that's, that's definitely like going to Utah, just realizing how good Joe Ingles is <laughs> from, from watching him to actually playing against him and practice him. Like talk about a guy who you can really underestimate if you don't know how good he is. Um, just guys who play their role perfectly on like on Utah Royce O'Neal for an example like you don't realize how good he actually is till you get in practice you get around him you, you're actually sitting on the bench in games and seeing just how much he does for a team even if he's not scoring the ball so there's it's it's definitely eye-opening just to see the talent level and how guys excel at a certain role and also even if they're asked to be outside that role how much they can do did did you have a a welcome to the league moment from like a either either an opponent or like a speed thing where you're like oh shit I'm really in it now? Um, well, my first oh shit moment I wasn't even playing I was on the bench and it was it might have even been our I think it was our our season opener or our home opener um, in Utah uh, we played the Warriors and like I'm sitting on the bench and KD scores maybe four or five in a row. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, this this dude is really seven foot. <laughs> like, <laughs> this guy is really 6'11", seven foot out here moving like a guard, moving just like guys on our team who are 6'4", 6'5". Like, it's that – him and Giannis were the first guys that I saw in person that were – it was just watching them, and I was like, oh, shit. Like, I literally got caught on the bench as a spectator my rookie year, just amazed at watching those guys. I feel like Giannis, Giannis has that effect on people. I think yeah. I think du Duncan talked to Robinson talked a little bit about that. KD really is like he really is the most talented player in the world. I'll just say that there's oh, there's yeah. no one like him. He is he is the ultimate unicorn. I I, I mean I hundred percent agree. Like there's it's just it's wild what he can do at at seven foot and it's smooth too. Like a lot of guys you see that are bigger, they just don't look smooth doing it. And, I mean, he's one of the smoothest players in the league. What about Grayson? What about in Utah with Quinn in terms of, you know, the, the change in preparation and everything like that, you know, from, you know, being a professional versus being, and we're going to get to some of the Duke stuff in a second, but just like, you know, when you're, you're on a certain sort of timeline, when you're a collegiate athlete versus like you are, you are an NBA player, you know, your, your responsibilities are different. Yeah. Well, that, the, the three to four days and like, a day of a day of light scouting and a day of heavy scouting before the game that you get in college. And then when you get to the league, you get, you know, all that same information given to you in one shoot around <laughs> before the day of a game <laughs> in 20 minutes, <laughs> in yeah. 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So you get, you get all that. And, and Quinn is Quinn is a genius as a coach too. So he's not gonna, there's no detail that he's going to miss. And so he expects you to know all that same stuff too. So my rookie year, I'm, I'm taking in all this information and trying to remember that and then swap to another team the next day and remember that just so, and then that speaks again to the, the minutes that I was getting, like just to go out there for four to six minutes and make sure I got every coverage that I was in right. And that there was no mistakes. The learning curve is so steep in the league in terms of, um, you know, coverage names, uh, the scouting, knowing players' tendencies. Like, you eventually learn it, and the amount of time that I have to, like, mentally prepare for an opponent or, or whatever 
is totally different than it was when I was in my third or fourth year. And even going to a new team, and I don't know if you experienced this at all, uh, going to Memphis, but even going to a new new team, you realize like there's only five or six actions we can run. There's only four or five coverages you can run on defense. It's just remembering what each team uh, calls them. And then if you've been in long enough, you realize there's only like four or five coaching trees. And so basically you just have to memorize like four or five terms for one play. And then you know them pretty much across the board. <laughs> What, what helped me, too, is, like, you got to realize how much basketball you have to watch. Like, about halfway through my rookie year, I just got to the point where it made it so much easier for me to remember personnel and, and what guys like to do in coverages just to have as many screens going, as many games on League Pass I could have going a night just so that I was familiar with people instead of giving a whole new sheet of, you know, here's eight guys off the bench that you have to know. You you played this year with uh, the NBA Rookie of the Year and John ja Morant. Um, he's one of the most electrifying and, and dynamic guards uh, in our league. Besides the athleticism, what what stands out to you uh, with him uh, as as his teammate and getting to to play with him and watch him watch him play this year? Uh, well, well, he's a, he's extremely unselfish. Like he's uh, it's. You know, there are times where you, you feel like he's playing too passive, and as a guy who's playing with him, you want him to do more. But he he really wants to get other guys involved. And then once there's kind of like that that moment in the game where the game kind of turns up a notch, it gets a little bit more intense, that's where he, he brings his level up and gets more intense too. And there were so many fourth quarters where, you know, he was kind of quiet the whole game, dishing. He probably had like eight or nine assists. And then the fourth quarter, he just – goes into attack mode offensively. Um, and so from being around him, he's – for being a, a rookie, like he was a really good leader to have as a point guard because of that, because he he really wants to get the other four guys on the court involved. And for someone who's like – you know, people were talking about him all year as the rookie of the year. There's so much attention on him, like so much excitement around his name like everyone wants to talk about the highlight plays like what he did on a consistent basis was get everyone else on the court involved in the game do you guys feel like the way the seeding games were set up do you feel like you got a raw deal do you feel like because there was this whole debate prior to the bubble about should we go straight to the playoffs should we play a few regular season games and this is just from a fan's perspective, not necessarily any my own perspective, but it seems like the NBA, uh, you know, and trying to create some some attention to that eighth seed, but they 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 kind of stacked the cards against you guys. We had a tough eight games. Our eight games were tough, um, and we started it off with we started off with a game day off, another and then a back-to-back, -back, and then a 2 p.m. game a day later, or a, two days later with a day in between. And that was that, that first stretch was tough. And then, you know, we ended it. We had Milwaukee, Toronto. Um, like, there were we – didn't, we, didn't we didn't have any games where you're looking around at other people's schedules and you're like, you, you kind of wish you had that. We didn't have any of those. Now, in saying that, all we had to do was win one more game and we were in the eighth seed spot, and we have the advantage playing against Portland where we have to win one, they have to win two. Um, so we 100% controlled our own destiny there. But if, if you look at it from before or you look at it from a fan's perspective, it looks like it looked like we had a harder time. But all we had to do was win one more game. We just had to score two more points in one game. That was it. Those first three games, those were all close games. Yeah. Um, you know, we had we had you on the second night of the back to back. So you guys had played San Antonio the day before, yeah. um, and and I think it was an overtime game. Yeah. And you know, Demar Derozan gets Dylan Brooks up in the air and makes two free throws to win the game. So they're like winnable games for sure. Um, let's for for all the um, the Duke haters out there. Now is the time to switch off the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Because we're going to talk about, we're going to start talking about Duke right now. Oh, they're going to have fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to go back to 2016 when you and I had a conversation. 
So we had texted a little bit. This was after your sophomore year. You won a national championship your freshman year with Jaleel Okafor and Justice Winslow and Tyus Jones. Mm -hmm. You scored 16 points in the national title game. You basically led the comeback uh, to, to, to win that game. Then your sophomore year, you were phenomenal. Um, you, were, you were an All-American. And we had a conversation. I remember it so vividly. I was in the office in my house. Uh, I was playing for the Clippers at the time. I was in the office at my house in Manhattan Beach. And I told you to go to the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> I told you to go to the NBA. Yeah. And your last two years at Duke were not the fairy tale that the first two years were. Right. Ha have you ever regretted not leaving, or you know, have you ever regretted not leaving after your sophomore year? Uh, no, not at all. And I think if I think if I were, you know, maybe when I'm five five more years down the line, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, you know, hopefully all is going well in the NBA, and I'm like, man, I wish I would have gotten to the second contract sooner. <laughs> maybe then, but. Uh, right now, like I, I have, I don't have a single one. Like I, there's not a single regret to not leaving. And it's solely off of the fact that I had so much fun in college those last two years and there's no going back to that. And the, the playing with those guys, my, my junior year, like quite frankly, for me, it was my hardest year at Duke. So right after you told me to go and I'm in the middle of my junior year, I'm like, damn, this shit sucks. <laughs> but, you know, coming back from my senior year, like having that, having the big moments of like, you know, a win on senior night, um, my relationship with coach kind of going up a notch my senior year and actually, you know, being the leader and the captain on that team. And, and on top of that, like I said before, the, the amount of fun that I had being a Duke student, those two years, like there's, then there's no going back to that. So there's not a single regret for me. When you were when you got to school initially, Grayson, did you when you were doing like your grand plan in your mind, did you envision yourself staying four years? Yeah. I mean that was I I was kind of, you know, our, our recruiting class was Justice Jaw and Tyus were all top ten players in our class and everyone thought they were gonna be one and done and then, you know, I'm coming in, I expected to be a four year guy, like I wasn't expecting to I definitely wasn't expecting to be one and done and I had you know multiple coach K never said this but there are multiple other college coaches who made it clear to me they're like we don't think you're one and done I was like okay well I don't think so either you, you got it <laughs> um, um, so I, I never I never thought about leaving early and I think that's that like I never had that plan in my mind I think that's what made it so much tougher to actually face that decision like I actually had to like think about it after I played in good in one game my freshman year, like people are saying I should have left. So um, it's, it's kind of weird to be faced with that decision when I was expecting not to have to deal with that at all. I had a very similar experience. I mean, I, I went in as a freshman and I told Coach K my goal is to get my jersey retired. And I knew that was going to be like a four-year thing. And all the guys in my class – you know, wanted to leave early. Sheldon ended up staying, of course. You know, Doc and and Lee Melchioni. We had a transfer, and Chav left early. But you know, I knew like I was going to be a four year guy. Like it, it, there was never really a moment, except for maybe three de three days after my junior year, where I even considered uh, considered leaving. And I just want to take this opportunity to apologize to all Duke fans for telling you to leave. I know Duke fans probably don't <laughs> want to hear that, <laughs> but. Um, but it, but look, it, it is the truth. I think you, you kind of mentioned this earlier when you're talking about down the line in regards to your second contract or your third contract. When you look at the economics of staying four years versus staying one or two years, it doesn't really make sense to stay longer than two years in college because you're going to get drafted based on your age, your second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever it may be. All those contracts are based on your age and your your pure potential production. Um, and the, the economics just just don't make any sense. And you played during a time during a, a Duke era when one and done were so prevalent. I played with I played with one guy. It was Lou Aldang that was one and done. Your list is. Jaleel Okafor, Tyus Jones, Justice Winslow, Brandon Ingram, Jason Tatum, Harry Giles, Frank Jackson, Marvin Bagley, K. 
Gary Trent, Wendell Carter, and I'll also note Trevon Duvall, who's who's in the G League. Um, year yeah. to year, the turnover <laughs> the turnover when you were there is just it's crazy. How much? How much? Especially your your you know junior and senior year. How much of your own personal performance and output and production was based on having to sort of share the load with? Luke and Marvin and Jason and all these guys that were that were coming in and expecting to be that one and done guy and expecting to put up big numbers. Uh, that was that was one of the big differences between my sophomore and, and junior year. And I, I kind of I knew that you know when I when I chose to to come back and play my junior year, I knew that I knew that was going to happen. Um, my junior year, I basically played point guard. So I went from averaging twenty one or twenty two, whatever it was, the year before to being our, our point guard and having, you know, Luke and Jason as our two biggest scorers on the wing around me. So my role changed, changed drastically. It was, it was completely different. And I think it was, it was a good, it was a frustrating thing at first, but it ended up being a good thing because I had to learn how to play different and, you know, expand a different part of my game. And then um, also learning to play with, like Jason was ready to be like a big time scorer from the moment he came to Duke. So learning to play with a guy like that and Brandon the year before, it was pretty much the same way. Like learning to play with guys like that has also been really helpful for me being in the NBA now. I was going to, I was going to ask both of you guys this, you know, I think one thing which is unique about Duke and Kentucky's like this or a few other schools are like this is is you are you're in a position where you're basically having to learn the whether it's the ego temperament whatever it is how to manage this with your teammates from the time you're a freshman in college you know and it's just such a it's such a difference from wherever you play in high school even if you play in high school at a at a great basketball school when do you feel like in your in your college run you got better at that at almost like the the sort of the the teammate management thing because you were we're one of the leaders in the team really since your freshman year. I'd say, I'd say end of my junior year, but for sure my senior year. Uh, part of the thing going back to my junior year is, you know, stepping into that point guard role is I did it. And then I also had in my mind, cause I was injured for most of my junior year and kind of playing at, you know, maybe like 70, 80%. Um, I also had in my mind, like, man, if I was healthy, like I could have done more scoring wise on this team when, you know, it might not have been what was exactly needed for our team with our with how many scores we had, but I always I always felt like there was like I wasn't my full self my junior year. Now my senior year, when I was like the cap- captain of that team, and um, you know we had Marvin, Gary, Wendell, and Trey. Like that's when I kind of fully learned what you're talking about and that kind of like management of the guys around us and what we need to do. Um, we had a mismatch almost every game with Marvin. Um, but then, you know, outside of that, when, you know, how to get Trayvon involved when they're just shifting off of him, when he's like an important piece and getting to the paint and finding and setting up other guys or getting Wendell involved when Marvin's spending most of his time on the block. Like, how do, how do you do that? How do you make Wendell a threat in the game? And, um, yeah, I mean, that definitely also helped. Tommy, to answer your question for me, I, I feel like I, I, I'm still learning to do that, to be honest with you. Because I, 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 I think when you're talking about leadership and you're talking about managing people, you, there's always something new to learn and there's also always mistakes that you're going to make. It's, 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 it's an imperfect science. And you know, if, you, if you're self-reflective enough and you can say like, oh, my junior year at Duke, I wish I had done this differently. I wish I had done this differently my senior year. Um, I wish I had encouraged this guy a little bit more because maybe in my off shooting night against LSU, he would have been a you know a bigger threat. We could have won that game. Um, so I, I'm I'm constantly racking my brain on that stuff. Look, I similar to your junior year, like my sophomore year to me was like a disaster for me. It was a low point. It was a low point of my life. Um, I've talked about this a little bit, but you know I partied a ton. Um, I was I was. Generally, generally regarded uh, across the country as an asshole. Um, some of that was well warranted, and I think part of that uh, maturation process was sort of understanding and coping with the pressure that 
comes with playing at Duke. And it it felt so much like a fishbowl when I was there, even more so than being 14 years in the NBA. I just felt like there was, it felt like such a small little world and everybody wanted something from me. Uh, did you feel that pressure? Did you feel that, that, you know, that notion of, of it being a fishbowl? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, it, playing, playing games in the NBA, there's so much less pressure than, uh, than college. And, you know, I went from, uh, I, I go from, you know, we're playing against Florida state and you have the, whole, I'm at the free throw line. You have the whole crowd chanting F you Grayson to playing in the NBA. I get to the free throw line. It's quiet in some gyms, even as a visiting team. So he, and even more than that, like your actual play, like, my my junior year, I because of the because of you know tripping incidents my sophomore and junior year, I have I was literally every game there was some kind of clip on ESPN of something I did that I didn't know about, and they're analyzing it to see if I did something dirty, or like, you know we play the same game against FSU I dive and save the ball, and then there's a. 10, 15 minute discussion on ESPN the next day on whether when I dive to get the ball, if I push the coach on the other team over or not. I'm like, so, and I, I, I can laugh about it now, but at the time I'm 20 years old waking up and I'm seeing this on ESPN. I'm like, this is terrible. Like I can't, like I can't get outside myself when I'm playing. I'm constantly thinking about what I'm doing out there on the court because it feels like, even if um even if we have Jason Tatum and Luke Kennard and our team scoring twenty points, like that's the that's the story. It's I felt like there were eyes on me, and and that's uh it's it's a relief to not have that in the NBA, but it's like it definitely sucks when you have to go through it at Duke until you get used to it. I want to break down this fishbowl notion and and this this pressure that I think is it's probably unique to Duke. Um, and and I don't want to get on a Duke elitism rant here, but it, it, <laughs> it, look the the amount of national t- nationally televised games that Duke has is one of, if not the highest, in the nation every year. The amount of media coverage that Duke gets is one of, if not the highest, in the nation every year. The Duke fans are intense, and the Duke Mafia. We Tommy, we talk about it all the time. The Duke Mafia is everywhere. And there's this whole network of people that live and breathe and die for Duke basketball. Uh, the notion of losing a game, like Duke losing a game, it's the end of the world. The sky is falling. There's this intense pressure to win and be perfect. There's the pressure that comes uh, from Coach K on a daily basis. And there's a standard of excellence that he's built for 40 years and that prior players have built for the last 40 years. And as players, we have to try to live up to that standard and that expectation. And it can be overwhelming. It can be draining. And, you know, on top of that, for for you and I and, and a, a handful of other guys, um, we had to deal with being the hated uh, white Duke guy. And that is not a fun thing to go through. <laughs> <laughs> You looked like you had more fun with it than me, though. <laughs> <laughs> who do you think? Who do you think was hated more? Uh, I, the only reason I would say myself is because of social media. Yeah, like I became a meme for months. I had friends sending me all these videos and stuff because I wasn't on Twitter at all. So I had friends that were sending me these videos that thought it was funny. Of all, like they would like Photoshop me laying on the ground with my leg up and like just sliding through all these different videos, like tripping random people and, (laughs) and whatever. (laughs) And it's really funny now, but at the time I was so annoyed by it, man. I was so annoyed by it. Tommy, who do you, who, who do you think, who do you think was more hated? I agree with Grayson. I think he was. And we talk, Grayson, we talk, JJ and I talk about it all the time, but he's had his own things with social media even recently. But I think that the, the constant drumbeat, on all of these platforms where where we are not just basketball players, everybody is conditioned to look at Twitter, look at Instagram, look at Snapchat, whatever it is. And the constant brumbeat of this thing where every time you look at your phone, you're a meme or you're this or someone's talking shit. It's like 
That's hard for anybody of any age to deal with, no matter what you do. When you're 19 or 20 and you have basically lived like a normal life and then all of a sudden you're thrown into the fire and you look at it and you're like, well, I didn't really do anything wrong. You know, if you get thrown into the fire because you like you you committed a crime or you screwed up in some way, da, 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 that sucks, but you brought that on yourself. Like all you're doing is just playing and all of a sudden you're this thing. That would crack anybody. I don't really know. We talk about it a little bit with Zion. I'm amazed with a lot of, and Zion hasn't gotten nearly the amount of shit that you guys got, but I'm amazed with young guys now how they're able to withstand this stuff because it's like, it is, it's never ending. It's constant for sure. Yeah, I, I, I have seen, but if you take out social media though, and you just go with crowds and then like the national media, it like I've seen like somebody, uh, I've seen some of the videos of you. I think it was uh, uh, Maryland, maybe Maryland might be some of the games or just some of the chance that the crowds had that might've even, they were on par or maybe even worse. So I don't know if you, if you just go game atmosphere, you're, you're, you, you might have me on that. So I, I think overall, I think the amount of uh, hate directed your way and the amount of attention to that hatred and, and stuff, I, I agree with you. And a lot of that has to do with social media and traditional media coverage too. I, I want to share in one game, my sophomore year, these four <laughs> things happened <laughs> in one game. Okay. I come out for warmups. There's a sign that says JJ drinks his own pee. Hilarious. Okay. <laughs> there's also a sign. There's also a sign that says uh, makes a reference to um, a lewd sex act with my 12 year old sister. Okay. Then there's a group of students sitting on the front row who have these custom T-shirts made, and they say, "When I," it's a picture of me, and they say, "When I grow up, I want to name my kid JJ Reddick." And then on the back it says, "And beat him every day." <laughs> so then. This, the Baltimore Ravens owner starts talking shit to me. He's sitting courtside. He starts talking shit to me. I'm I'm having a good game, so I start yapping back. This, of course, incites other people in the stands to start yelling things at me. And then, at the end of the game, I'm hitting the sort of game-clinching free throws, and the entire arena starts chanting, fuck you, JJ. That was one game. <laughs> and that, from not even that point on, because it was happening before that, that was pretty much every road game that I had at Duke. That was my experience. Um, I didn't have to deal with social media and thank God I didn't because I don't know that I would have not been kicked off the Duke team. <laughs> <laughs> Grayson, did they do Did they do stuff like, I know they did this, did, did, did they do stuff where they would like call the hotel or anything like that? Uh, no, my, my phone number got out a couple of times. So like the night before a game, uh, I would I would got flooded with calls and text messages, um, and I think it was Florida State that it first happened. So someone I probably because I had my original number till my sophomore year, and so I think someone from like high school or something somehow got my number and leaked it out at Florida State. And then there was another time my number got out. I never got the hotel thing though. What, do you, Do you remember any clever signs or clever chants? that you could share? Is there anything that ever tickled you a little bit and made you chuckle? The the very first time I saw the karate kid sweep the leg one, <laughs> that one, that one made me laugh. Um, and then my big, my big thing with everyone, everyone like thought I looked like ev literally everyone. Like there's Ted Cruz, there's Kevin from the office. There's, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the the little king from uh, Game of Thrones. I'm blanking. On oh, Joffrey. Name. Yeah, Joffrey. Joffrey <laughs> king Joffrey. And there's like a list of five or six others. So I would always have like my face side to side or like over that. Like I just apparently I just look like everyone, no matter if they're 13 to 50. You know, I, I don't know. I don't get it. So, so here's a question that I have for you about this this uh, this Duke villain thing. Did you feel like you were a villain even before you decided to start tripping people? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I, for some reason, I remember this after my freshman year. I remember this video that came out, and it wasn't by one of the big media sites. It was by one of those off media sites that mainly just does social media. And 
it listed, it said that I was going to be most hated and it listed three reasons why. And the three reasons were I'm white, I'm good at basketball and I play for Duke. Those were the three reasons that I was going to be hated in college. And I read that list and I like looked at that list. I was like, what am I supposed to do about that list? Like there's nothing, I can't do anything about that. Like I, I am those three things. So from that kind of made me realize like, okay, I, I, I might be in for something, but I never, I didn't actually realize the scope of it. I still, to this day, every, every time I'm around any type of Wisconsin fan though, they have to come up to me and, and let me know how much I broke their heart or made them mad. Um, the reason I asked that question is because I, I feel like the, the Duke villain thing is just, I don't want to call it a myth because I don't, I, I think, you know, all of us in some ways when we're 19 or 20 do things to antagonize people. But I talked about this when you were in school on my podcast four years ago, and it's almost like every decent white player that comes in is just like anointed by traditional media as like the next hated guy. Yeah, You know, I, I was that guy and then it was shot, you know, Paulus was going to be that guy. And then it was Shire was going to be that guy. And you just go down the line and they're, they're, they're telling people to hate, to hate us. And like, like Shire, <laughs> John Shire, God bless him is one of the nicest, most kind human beings I've ever been around. Yeah. How could you hate him? <laughs> well, I, I think it's, I think it's like a, it's something that people want to happen. Like from from a narrative standpoint. So like, even if you have someone like Shire in that place where probably never did a thing wrong, like I think what like Shire's thing was Shire told me he had a website where all it was, was pictures of his face in games. Cause he makes ugly faces when he plays. So there's like a website where Shire game face or something. And all it had was pictures of him making weird faces. So I think it's something that's like just, forced upon me and I get I get I still get mentioned all the time on Twitter about people who are who are uh like trying to figure out who the next one's going to be at Duke like it was Alex O'Connell for a little bit and now like for this year's team they're like saying it's going to be Joey Baker like it's like these guys haven't even played yet or like right. Alex was barely even playing when people were saying this I, I was like it's just Gracie, did you think when you were making your decision um in high school was this in your mind at all Oh no, not at all. No, I, I mean, I never, I never thought about it. I never, I definitely never thought it was going to be me. Yeah. Not, I never thought about it once. It is a really weird phenomenon. It, it, you, you can't, you can't prepare for it either. Like someone, yeah. someone could have told me, and someone could have told you prior to us playing at Duke, like they're going to hate you. But for the most part, what they said was, "Oh, the Cameron Crazers are going to love you," and one of the things that happened to me is like we played neutral sites and like nine home games before we ever played a true road game. And I, I've told this story a bunch, but you know, we have our first road game. It's right around new year's. We're playing at Clemson and I come out for warm ups, and they're just the whole student section is picking on me. And I'm like, what, what is going on here? Like I'm hooping. I'm good. We're good. We haven't lost a game yet. Like what? <laughs> Why are y'all saying this stuff about me? I, I don't understand. And I think for if you have any sort of, you know, whatever, if you have any shit to you, if you have any asshole to you, um, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna turn from that. You're gonna you're gonna uh, you know approach that, and you're gonna you're gonna fight against that, and yeah. that perpetuates the cycle. Because now they're saying like, look, oh look, we were right, we were right. This guy, he deserves to be hated. You know. Um, I want to, I want to talk to you about one thing specifically about the tripping stuff. So the, the time you did it against Elon, yeah, I think that was your junior year, right? Or is that junior year, senior year? That was my junior year. Junior year. So I just remember you going back to the bench and, and you were so upset and, and subsequently, uh, I think coach took your captaincy briefly and he suspended you for a game. But, you know, watching you react that way, 
I tried to put myself in, you know, in your head and trying to sort of understand that emotion and that anger that was coming out because, you know, you know, you fucked up and you know, there's going to be consequences from that. And you're like, I, I pictured myself at 2021 when I was going through my shit at Duke and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to get better. I really am trying. And then, you know, you're like, it's such a slippery slope. You're like you're one, one more mistake away from just getting crushed. What? What was going through your mind when you had that reaction on the bench? And, and also just how tough it was it subsequently when Coach, coach did that? Yeah, well, it, it's exactly what you said. Because, like, people in the moment when they watch it, they think I'm, like, upset at the call and trying to act like I didn't do anything. When it was – the opposite was, like, I was, like – I thought I was good. And, like, I thought I was, like, you know, I'm, like, going into my junior year, you know, like, it's, like – turn a leaf, nothing's going to happen. Like I'm, I'm good. There's, there's going to be nothing going on. And then this happens. So that moment going to the bench, I just know in my head, like I already know what it's going to be like after the game. I know when I open my phone, what it's going to be like on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I know that I've, I've, I've gone somewhere that I'd told myself for a whole off season, a whole summer, a whole preseason. I, I don't, that was like in December, like a whole season. Like I told myself, you know, this is somewhere I wasn't going to go. And it was in my head. Like I wanted so much not to be hated for that season that I didn't want to do anything wrong. And then that happens. And I was already under all this pressure that like, I didn't realize how fragile I was in that moment of just like that, that was my reaction. Cause I, I had snapped because I knew that like, I, I knew what was going to happen. I knew the reaction. I was trying so hard to avoid that. Um, and I was, I was struggling with that because I hated playing, knowing that I was being watched every second, knowing that um, I was this most hated guy who everyone, who everyone viewed a certain way. Like I, I hated that. And so I, then I do the thing that adds to that. And so it just, in that moment, I was, I was so upset at myself. And I think after the game, I even, you know, coach grabbed me to go apologize to um, – it was – his name was Steven, Steven, Steven Santa Ana, I think his name was. Um, and so I went to apologize to him after that. Uh, I had one of my teammates take my phone. I was like, can you just delete Twitter off this because off this? I don't even want to see any of this shit at all. And, and then uh, coach – we had – I had long – I had a bunch of meetings and talks with coach after that. And part of it was because coach wanted to, uh, you know, he wanted to suspend me and there was going to be consequences for what I did. But the other part of that was like the reaction afterwards was he wanted to make sure like I had, I needed to get my mind in the right place to go play again too. And so thankfully, you know, people talk about this like indefinite suspension being one game. It was our Christmas break. So I was, I was suspended. I had to go home. It was like a 10 day, 10 day period basically where I didn't play. And I was, I wasn't even really practicing. Like I was in the doghouse for 10 days basically. And at the same time trying to get my mind ready to like, if you go back out there, like you got to be in the right mindset to get out there on the court and play, you know, you can't be in this fragile, fragile place. I, I have to ask you this though. So you, you told yourself, I'm not going to do this thing. Yeah. And there's that old th thing where like, you know, don't, don't think about an elephant. What are you going to think about? Elephant, <laughs> right? It's if you said to me, don't say fuck, I'm going to be like, fuck, I have to say fuck, you know? <laughs> what, what, what is it that makes you trip someone on a court? Like, why is that your natural, or not, not I shouldn't say natural because it's not a natural thing, but why is that the thing that kept happening? Uh, I think it was, what well, it was always a, it was always a, like some type of retaliation thing. And so in that clip, I'm guarding the guy. And, you know, it's like that offensive move where you pin the defender's arm when he's in there. And so you get the foul call. So he had my arm pinned and was kind of like swinging. So I had like swung around. And my reaction in the moment to like get this guy back was like, well, he has my arm. So here's my leg. I'm going to trip him with my leg, right? And then we go back to the Florida State one. Um the Florida state one, we're at the end of the game. We're up like 15, 20 games over. They're trapping and fouling with like 20 seconds left, 15 seconds left. Um, like 
the game's like they, they just let us dribble off the clock, right? And they've been trapping and fouling. The guy uh, who I was guarding had been doing it too, and I was off the ball. And they were grabbing off the ball and everything with 20 seconds left, and it just got under my skin. And so when he when he's running by, he's run, he goes to run behind me to go on a fast break with 15 seconds left to score, and that was my that was just my reaction. So I don't think it, it was never like there was never this predetermined thing like I'm gonna trip somebody. It was just like in the moment, like that's how I went, that's I was gonna retaliate to somebody, and it just happened to be that was the <laughs> that was the best place for me to retaliate in my mind. Do you think that? The growth from that is that is that I, I assume it's some of that is just immaturity. Yeah. Um, like as you've sort of talked through this with people and you've processed it on your own, like how have you been able to sort of move move past it and 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 be better? Everyone that's a competitor like wants retaliation in some some sense, right? There are all these basketball plays that people do that they get someone back two plays later and it's either a hard foul or something within the game. But for me, I did it a, a second later and it was something cheap, like a, it was yeah, a karate move. Cheap. You did a karate move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sweep play. Right. It was something cheap. So it, it's basically like get them back a minute later with the, with something basketball related. And another big thing that helped, uh, this is why my senior year I was, I was, uh, I felt like I was in a much better place is that like, I was, I was thinking about myself so much and like in a game like that, thinking about yourself and like, you're trying not to mess up. Like you're not thinking about the other, you're not thinking about the game. You're not thinking about the, your four teammates on the court, right? You're just, all you're thinking about is what you're doing. And so my senior year, when I got outside myself, one, it made me play better because I'm not constantly pressure on myself thinking about what I'm doing, how I'm doing. All I'm thinking about is what are we doing and how are we doing? And like everything that I do on the court just falls into place in that. I have one retaliation story real quick because <laughs> I want to I wanna just let everybody know that this is a thing. Like, th There's ways to do it in ways that are not, I wouldn't call them dirty. So Andrew Bogut was a very physical player. He is a physical player. Um, and he's got an edge to him. And so like, he uses his physicality in ways that some people don't like. And we were playing in Golden State when I was with the Clippers and that was a heated rival. You can't really call it a rivalry. We beat them once in the playoffs, and then they won three championships. But um, we were playing, and, and he, he set like an illegal screen on me, and I was mad about it. And I wasn't thinking in my head, like, I'm going to fuck this guy up. It just so happened, though, that the next offensive possession was like one of those four-on-three fast breaks, and Clay or Steph took a three from the left wing, and he was trailing, and he ran in for the offensive rebound. And it just so <laughs> happened that I happened to be the guy that was supposed to box him out in that situation. I was the next guy. And so I just, as hard as I could, I just T-boned him. I chucked him right in the chest. And he did not see me. And I hit him. And it kind of like, you know, he got he went back, and it knocked the wind out of him. And he kind of looked at me like, should I, you know, and I looked at him, and I said, we're even now. And he goes, okay. <laughs> he goes, okay, you're right. You're right. You're good. So that, I mean, look, it wasn't necessarily like, I, I mean, it probably should have been a foul, but it wasn't like it was, I wouldn't call it a dirty play. So there's ways to do it. Are you, do you worry that, that those incidences, those incidents will, will just follow you the rest of your career? Are you, are, are you worried that it's always going to be an anecdote to, to Grayson Allen's career, Grayson Allen's story? Uh, I think it will be. I'm not confident in it letting up. But I don't think uh, – I don't, like, think about it. Like, I'm not – I don't think that bothers me as much. Like, I obviously, if I could go back in time, I wouldn't trip anybody. Like, <laughs> like that's, that's, like, the cl – that's clear. But I don't think it bothers me. Like, I don't – it doesn't – like, it doesn't bother me that, like, either I've gotten so used to it and, like, I realized that, like, it was just part of my journey where I just – I just had to – I had to fuck up. Like, I had to make some mistakes to, to learn. Um and like in the grand scheme of things, like I didn't injure anybody. I didn't try to injure anybody. Like I, 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 my mistakes were on the court tripping incidents. I wasn't like committing crimes and doing stuff off the court. Like in the grand scheme of things, I, I, I feel like I'm okay with it being part of my story because I, I've learned from it. And um, I don't know. I, I don't, 
it's hard to see like my growth that had to happen in college maturity wise and becoming a leader and, and being comfortable in, in who I am and not having an ego about how I play or who I am. I, I like, it's hard to picture how that would happen if I didn't have to go through that. Like it's, it's hard to That's picture. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. an interesting it's, point. Like, I don't know if I would have ended up how I am right now if I didn't go through that. So I don't know. It's, it's obviously something I'd go back. Like if I could go back in time, I wouldn't do it, but I don't know if I'd be out on this end, the same person. It is, it is interesting. We talked about this with both with D Wade and with Bosch. I don't think, I mean, it's very separate, very different circumstances, but I don't think either of them particularly liked um, when they were hated, you know, when they were playing and they were the villains all the time. But I think, and I think D Wade said this to us, you know, there are parts of it that help them because you it, it gives you perspective on sort of on everything moving forward. You know, you just think about things differently when you've been in that in that frame of mind. Do you are are this is kind of a sort of like broad question, but like are you thinking about that often? Or you have you been able to sort of like compartmentalize like, okay, this is my past and now I'm in Memphis you know, I'm, I'm, I've had a successful sort of run here. The, the future is super bright. I'm not going to hide from it, but I'm also, it's not, it's not like a chip on my shoulder. You know, it's not like a motivational tactic. Yeah. I mean, no, it's not a, it's not a motivational tactic at all. It's not like, you know, I don't have in my, in the back of my mind, like all these people that were talking shit about me in college, like, wait till they see me now. Like it's, yeah. it's not that kind of thing at all. Um, I, I just, I get, I get reminded of it though, because it's like, people still want to make it a part of like who I am. So, you know, I, I, you know, I think, you know, I think as, as my NBA career progresses and like, if, if I continue to play well and kind of expand my role and, you know, carve out a spot for me in the league, like, I think it'll maybe start to go away, but people, you know, it's, you know, if they're writing an article about me playing well in the bubble or if people are talking about me playing well in the bubble, it's like you have to mention that, you know, when I was a sophomore in college, I tripped somebody. And I don't know if I'll ever get away from that, but um, it def- it doesn't bother me anymore to see that. If, if there's growth, if there's real growth and there's real transparency and there's honesty and there's authenticity, people do forget People do. <laughs> I mean, look, I, 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 I've made enough mistakes in my life and I, I've made enough mistakes publicly in my life to know that maybe people never forget, forget, but it stops being an anecdote in the article about your shooting. You know, <laughs> yeah. like I, 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 I'll give you an example. You know, no, nobody really talks about the fact that I had a DUI when I was 21 and I got arrested two weeks before the draft and I spent a night in jail, I didn't think that life could be any worse. I thought my life was over. I thought I was going to have to, I remember sitting in the jail cell and just being like, I'm going overseas. Like all, everything I work for at Duke, it's, it's, it's all gone. It's done, you know? And that, that would get mentioned in articles. And then being a bum my first two years in the league, you know, it, that, it took to like my eighth or ninth year before that start, stopped being an anecdote in every article. So I think that, I think the point I'm trying to make is like, if you're learning from mistakes, failures, whatever you want to call them, both on and off the court, and there's real growth, and you have that mindset, uh, and that's that's an authentic thing, then the the hatred dissipates, the animosity dissipates. It's just a natural evolution in my mind. Yeah. Well, I was also going to add. I think we've seen definitely in the comments about this podcast, we have a lot of people be like. I hated JJ <laughs> until I started listening to him on this show or, or not even just on the show, but like listen to him give interviews and listen to him kind of like give his perspective on things that are not even just basketball related. And so you just realize basically that like, and I think this is going to even increase more so now it's the beauty and the curse of social media is people have short memories about stuff. And so like the idea that people are going to hold anybody to something that happened in like 2017 or something like that seems crazy. It's like we barely remember what happened three weeks ago. And it's just and and it's like you go off in a playoff game, no one's gonna be like, Oh, that's the <laughs> that's the, <laughs> the tripping guy. You're like, no, that's fucking that's Grayson who's just killing it. So that is that that feels like the natural progression to me. To be very clear, I'm still well aware that there's a lot of people that hate me. 
that's okay though like that's yeah. okay i'm okay with it at this point like there's a whole group of philly fans that hate me and i played for their team and i did well for their team yeah, they, they kind of hate me. you for no they kind of hate you for no reason too well no i don't want to get into it i don't want to get into it yeah but there's a whole group <laughs> like i played for their team i wasn't even on the other team like i had my two best seasons in the nba for them and i they still hate me like yeah you grow up can't and you're it. like ah can't help it yeah I think with that, I think with that too, with what you just said, there's always going to be people that hate you. And I think that's that's one of the interesting, that's one of the interesting perspectives that you have to have with social media, because after after every bubble game that I played well in, I would be trending on Twitter, but you click on it and it's that group of people who hate me. They're like, it's either like, damn, Grayson Grayson Allen actually still plays in the NBA, or it's like, damn, that's the tripping guy from college, <laughs> or it's it's that group of people who who want to talk about you because of that. So that's the interesting thing about social media is that the only people that are going to talk about you are the people that actually have an opinion on you, whether they hate you or like you. Then there's a whole group of people who are now indifferent because it's been three years. Oh, man. The guy still plays basketball. It's been, yeah, it's, it's been three, <laughs> three, three Damn, years. Ted, Ted, Cruz, Ted Cruz is balling. <laughs> Ted Cruz is balling. Um, all right. We're going to do a quick speed round, uh, and then we'll get to the draft. All right, my first question: Who wins in a dunk contest between Zion or Ja Morant? Not Julia Okafor, Ja Morant. Ja Morant or Zion in a dunk contest? Uh, ja, I think Ja can do close to the same dunks as Zion, but he, it's a little bit more impressive because he's smaller. College or pro? Who has been your favorite teammate, personality-wise? Like funniest, most entertaining? Um. Frank Jackson. Oh, love it. I, I was hoping you would say that. <laughs> it was like, my, when he was a freshman, one of the goofiest and funniest people to be around ever. I'll, I'll co-sign that. Frank was so <laughs> awesome this year. Like, oh my God. He's just, he's funny. He's real. He's like, he's his own person. Tommy, you know who he reminds me of a little bit? He's like a, he's like a Kelly Oubre. He's like, like those guys are just like, they run on a different wavelength. Yeah, <laughs> and they're just they're just so great to be around. You always need people like that in your life, no matter what, yes. you know, no matter what capacity. But that's especially good in a locker room because yeah. most people are, they stand out. I don't know what your eating habits are, but uh, I'm a I'm a big barbecue guy. I want to get your take on Memphis barbecue versus North Carolina barbecue, specifically like the the pulled pork vinegar based Eastern North Carolina barbecue. <laughs> Uh, I'm not a huge barbecue person, but I've obviously, while I was in North Carolina, tried it. And while I've been in Memphis, enough people told me I had to try it, so I tried it. Um, and, like, because I don't eat a lot of barbecue, it's hard for me to tell that much of a difference. Like, I don't have that big of a, like, my taste isn't refined to know, like, the difference in North Carolina barbecue to Memphis barbecue. So you're going to give a non-answer here. I'll give the answer then, North Carolina barbecue. Okay, Tommy, next question. <laughs> what was your uh so you were when you were in high school you were on all the mixtapes all the youtube did it what yeah. was your kind of like highlight from that era of pre-duke uh like my best highlight is that what you're saying yeah yeah uh well i had uh this also goes to the overreaction on social media i had a dunk my junior year i think yeah, my junior year in high school, we were in our, it was like our state semifinals. And it was just a fast break dunk, like pretty, my, by nowadays, social media standards, pretty average. Like now you have Zion who's cocking it back to his ankle before he dunks while he's in high school. So I had a simple one foot cock back dunk, which was special for me in a game. They side by sided it with LeBron on one of those ESPN shows. I forget which one it was literally had a side-by-side -side picture of it with LeBron and me on a fast break, which uh, I hope everyone who hears this knows that I know I don't look like LeBron when I go dunk the ball, but that was uh, really cool for me as a junior in high school to see. I just like, I, I just like the fact that when he came out of college and he had a 41 inch vertical, he had to throw a shot at me for not being able to jump, jump like him. <laughs> like, why, I can't remember the exact quote. <laughs> well, they kept making you my player comp for the NBA. <laughs> like, well, yeah, JJ didn't have a 41-inch vert, though. That was my 
that was my uh, <laughs> that was my answer to why you were always my player cop. Fuck, man. I just <laughs> I just feel like you could have answered that. I know I you get annoyed with the same player comp. Do you just, does it bother you when people compare you and I? Uh, I mean, no. I mean, I'd, I'd love to have yeah. a long NBA career. That'd be cool. <laughs> like it's not a it's not a bad thing, but it's it's lazy. It's definitely lazy. Yeah, it's lazy. I agree. I'm I'm way better than you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's get. Let's Even get, with the thirty inch vert, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's that's not my standing vert. That's my that's my max <laughs> vert with a full run. <laughs> no, it's higher than that. It's higher than that. Actually, my max my max vert. You can look this up at the combine. Was I think thirty six inches. That's when I used to be able to dunk, and I had a hernia disc at the time. Um, let's get to the draft for this week um, because we spent so much time talking about being a villain. We are going to draft the all-time best sports movie villains. We're going to snake it. You're going to go first. But it's a, whoever you pick, you're first. I'm second. JJ's third. So you're up. Got you. Uh, my first pick was going to be the Beast from Sandlot. Oof. I had that. I wow. had that one. That's a Sandlot's good pick. Sandlot's one of my favorite movies. All right. Uh, my, my, uh, kid, my kids watch that all the time. They watch it all the time. It's, it's a great right pick. now. Right now, it's that. It's Sandlot, Little Rascals, and Little Giants. Ooh, Little Rascals. Giants. Little Rascals holds up. Yeah. Little Rascals good. holds up. Little Rascals is fantastic. All right, I'm taking him off the board because I he's not going to last to my next pick. Shooter McGavin, number oh. one. <laughs> of course. Yeah, he was he was very high on my big board. Um, that's disappointing. I'm gonna have to cross him off. Okay. <clears throat> um. First two picks that I have, I'm going to take Johnny Lawrence off the board from Karate Kid. Sweep the leg. Yep. Um, and I'm going to take White Goodman off the board oh. from Dodgeball. Yeah. Interesting. I'm Solid. getting a lot of mine taken. This is why you, you need to you need to have a lot of backup. <laughs> Number two, I'm going. Uh, I'm going. Coach Kilmer from Varsity Blues. Ooh, interesting. I just thought he was like a he was the the best villainous coach in a sports movie that I can remember. And he had the board. his he had his own team walk out on him. Yes. Yeah, it's a good pick. I like it. All right, Grayson, All right, you Grayson, get two. You got two. All right. Uh... For my first, I'm going to go with John Gerard, Talladega Knights. Ooh. Good pick. I like that pick. Um, and then my my next one, let's go with Ivan Drago, Rocky. I was waiting. I was wondering when we were going to go on the Rocky run. Yeah. That's good value in the third round. I think it's <laughs> I debated taking him with my with the fourth pick overall, but my my second pick. That was that's a gr- that's a great choice. Okay, my third pick. I got another coach, Coach Riley from Mighty Ducks. It, that's the first Mighty Ducks. First Mighty Ducks. Adam Banks is coach. Adam Banks is coach. Yep. I don't even remember the Mighty Ducks. Well, you were like four, so you should watch. Them. <laughs> How many of them were there? Three. There were three. Mighty Ducks yeah. is Mighty Ducks is awesome. We've talked about this a ton, but I really I'll, I'll I'll say this again. Gordon Bombay has to be at least in the top three greatest sports movie coaches ever. The guy wins at every oh, yeah. level. All he does Did is we, win. We rank those with Lonzo, right? You yes. picked him, I think. Yeah, and I Lonzo had never seen Lonzo. I think there's a generation that has just not seen the Mighty Ducks. That just doesn't know it. Um. All right. Lots of stuff off the board here. Okay. Uh. My third pick, I'm going with. I'm gonna take Clubber Lang off the board from Rocky Three, and I'm gonna take. I'm also gonna choose a Mighty Ducks coach. I'm gonna choose Wolf the Dentist Stanson from D2, the Mighty Ducks. He's the head coach of the uh, about of Team one. Iceland. Yeah, solid. Yeah, I think this great. is a. I think this is a quarantine activity for you, Grayson. It's just run through the. Just watch all the Mighty Ducks movies. One weekend, just, well, just roll I've, through. I've all seen them. I just saw them, you know, fifteen years ago, and never watched them again. Yeah. All right. <laughs> my fourth. My fourth. I knew somebody was going to take uh, White Goodman early, and I wasn't going to get him. 
So, have you guys seen Heavyweights? Another Ben Stiller character. I don't think so. Tony that, Perkis. Wait. <laughs> Tony Perkis from Heavyweights. Is, That's a is sports my movie? Pick. That's a sports yeah, movie? Yeah, it's a fat camp. They're all playing sports the whole time. They're super engaged, and he's trying to get them in shape and get them running and everything like that. He's a sports villain. It's not a... I don't... But he's... I don't know that that's a that sports That counts. Movie. It counts. Yeah, I don't want 100% counts. <laughs> heavyweights, heavyweights is all about physical activity and them getting in shape. I don't think there's, shape. A, there's not necessarily like a sporting event though. Yeah, there's, there? like a deca- there's like a decathlon at the end. He's running. All right, that's a, is, you, that's, Grierson, you've never reach. seen heavyweights? No, never have. Oh my God, dude. Watch that tonight. All right. that's, forget Muddy Ducks. We're, we're going to let Twitter and Instagram decide this. Yeah, that's a, that, that, that is real. My ne- my next pick is someone who's not. It's not necessarily a sports movie. Jesus Quintana from The Big Lebowski. Oh, that's a good one. Ooh, that counts. That, that, counts. that, counts, that counts for counts, sure. Right? Bowling yeah. is a sport. Yep, that's a good one. I'll tell you what, Grayson's got a solid list. Grayson, going you right got now. one more. You close it out. Oh, my next one, Ross the Boss from The Goon. Wow, never saw you, that. You ever, you ever seen wow. The Goon? This is a this, you. I think Grayson has won this. L- this draft. <laughs> it's a solid list, man. You've never yeah. seen the goon? No, I haven't. There's a lot of diversity on this in this group. Hey, Tommy, you should pick one more coach here just to round no. it out. No, I got a uh I got a I got a do you ever see any given Sunday? Yeah, uh, a long time ago, but yes. Dr. Harvey, James Woods, mm-hmm. the doctor in any given Sunday, he's my number five. The guy that's trying to give them uh Trying to trying to make them get on the field when they're hurt and juice them up. That's my fifth pick. God, there's so many good ones that I can choose with number five. I'm really torn on this. So I, I want to acknowledge Birdie from Above the Rim. I also want to acknowledge Fairchild and Strons Van Weldenberg from Blades of Glory. But my fifth pick, I'm going to go with Rachel Phelps. She's the owner in Major League and Major League Two. I had this one. Yeah. Just Solid. absolute villain. And I think with that pick, I may have won this draft. We shall late, see. Late round value. We shall see. I definitely won. Uh, Grayson, thank you so much for the time. Uh, th- I appreciate it, man. We, we appreciate you. Thanks for being open and uh, down to do this. And... Uh, Come back whenever, man. Yeah, come back whenever. You're always welcome. If you're bored, just hop on. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.